What's up, best friends? My name is Brian Deach, and today I'll be doing an update to the Zscaler data protection platform. You still down with DPP? Yeah, you know me. Chances are, if you didn't understand that reference, then you don't understand this one, which is A-OK, baby birds, because I'm going to feed you. If you scroll down below the description of this video, you'll find a link to the previous Zscaler data protection platform. Go dot your I's, cross your T's, review the video, then come back in here to get all the, all the new cool updates. Now, with that said, the data protection platform is hosted by the ZTE, the Zero Trust Exchange. Zero trust by nature, not because I hate you. What do I mean by that? It is a strategic point of control and a strategic point of visibility. It helps us reduce your exposure and helps mitigate risk. We get visibility into the internet, visibility both inline and out of band for your SaaS-based applications, out of band connectivity into your private cloud, and of course, users coming in through a third-party portal, whether going into a SaaS-based application through the data center or your users working from anywhere, helping protect them at all costs. Now, this gives us the ability to kind of gain control, right? We're in line. We can do uh, file types. We can do uploads, downloads, tenant restrictions. But let's pull it back a little bit. It is all about controlling sensitive data. What is sensitive data? Well, it really depends. Be PCI, HIPAA. Uh, PII type of data, the list kind of goes on. Maybe you only care about driver's licenses, right? The ability to control that. Because back in the day, it made sense that you kept them all in one little spot, but your business has evolved. You have to incorporate the internet and SaaS and partners, and the list kind of goes on and on. So you need to have a good, ad uh, adequate audit trail, be able to tra uh, figure out where this data is going, and that it should be going there. And you need to be able to do this across your devices, the network, and the cloud. And last but not least, the bane of every DLP administrator, incident management, and trying to figure out what is good versus what is bad, the false positives, and the list kind of goes on and on. Now, before we get into the updates, it is imperative that we understand that you can't really do this without good efficacy. You have to have a solid engine behind the scenes. So we come over here and look at the engine in question. And the engine isn't just like a one trick pony you should have a couple of different things going on. So we talked about in the previous video, we have AI ML based dictionaries. We can switch gears a little bit. Maybe you've already done some cl uh, classification historically with like Microsoft information protection, perhaps even rubric. Maybe you want to look at index document matching or IDM for short, be able to, Scan those files, create a fuzzy match, go about your day. That's your unstructured data. Switching gears, maybe there's some structured data that you want to look at. Exact data match, create a fingerprint of that information. And of course, we have uh, you know predefined dictionaries or phrases that are out there. And last but not least, there's always a use case, corner use case for the, the ability to support regex as well. And what's imperative on this is if you have the ability to kind of put your data into this engine, then you can create rules or different verdicts because it isn't allow or block anymore. There can be a, a, a multitude of different things that can actually happen. So when we put that in the, in our, into our mind, now we can start to talk a little bit about the updates that are coming out. So the first one I want to talk to you guys about today is regarding email, enterprise email. Now we have the ability to kind of inject headers, right? So instead of an allow or block, I can quarantine, I can watermark it. If I gave you a good use case today, it would be like, I am sending an email to another person at Zscaler, but also to one of my peers at salesforce.com. That's not a problem. However, I'm going to be sensing, uh, sending some sensitive information to both parties. Now before, you might just reject that, right? And that's that kind of breaks collaboration. What's more of an intelligent way of doing this? I can focus in on the engine. I can look at the different entities in which I'm sending this email. I can look at and say, hey, to that user going out to salesforce.com, maybe I watermark it. Brian's credentials are over there. And then I can create a DLP event and say, hey, I can uh, message Brian later on. Like, why did you do that? We'll provide some more context on that later. So that's some of the cool things that we're doing around uh, email. The next one's going to be around endpoint DLP. And before I had the ability to prevent a user from taking something sensitive and copying over to USB drive. 
it's kind of a heavy handed approach and that's changed. And so what I can do now is I can say, Hey, if this user has like a desktop and a laptop and they want to copy something over to a USB drive, I can allow them to do that. I can encrypt it. And then when they take it over here to this other laptop, I have peace of mind knowing that they can't do anything with this data. It's encrypted unless it's on a sanctioned PC. The next one would be around the endpoint scanning. So let's say I have a user, they're going out to OneDrive, maybe they're saving a bunch of copies of things over here, maybe there's driver's licenses or credit card numbers. I'd scan this endpoint to know definitively if they have any sensitive information on the endpoint. And last but not least, I can do some end user notifications. So right from my little agent, I can coach the user through different outcomes. The next one's gonna be on this out of band front, but specifically around data security posture management. What I want to do here is kind of frame it up. So like, think of it this way. You have this engine, you use it for inline, use it for endpoint, uh, use it for your portal-based people that are coming through, decisions to throw them browser isolation or email. When we get into data security posture management, that's like really looking at data, compute, and uh, storage. So let's pick on Azure real quick and say you have RDS set up. And that means you have a database that's over here. Okay, looks and smells good. This is pretty pretty much the same. And over there we have some PCI information. Again, not that big of a deal, but what Zscaler is going to do is it's going to go out and find your data in the private cloud and then provide some context to it. Because right now, at a first glance, like this makes sense. Like this is where it should be. Okay, and then we we pull in other things to it. Okay, is it have federated identity. So there's an IDP right here, and then you can audit the users that are connecting to this. Again, not that big of a deal, but now we also see in our audit, we see an admin or like a, a root user hanging out over here. Again, starting to get a little questionable, but then how do you prioritize this versus something else? Well, there's more context that comes into play. Well, who can talk to this? Well, it turns out you allow the entire internet in, and it's coming in across HTTP, HTTPS, and oh, by the way, SSH is running here. here. So data security posture management is going to look at this from a whole and be like, hey, I know definitively that there is data, PCI data here. I have found kind of a default root username and password right here. And oh, by the way, it is open to the entire internet over a week or vulnerable protocol, maybe just SSH, which is, I think we all agree, is a bad thing. Taking this into account, now you can help prioritize, like, hey, out of all the different things, all the RDS things that we have out there, this is the one that we should probably figure out. Maybe it's just blocking access to SSH. Maybe that shouldn't be there. Maybe it's just removing this. And maybe you'll step up and say, hey, for the identity portion, you'll do step up authentication or multi-factor, right? Providing context and value in there. Now this is great, but the bane of every DLP administrator's uh, existence is incident management. I always like to say it's like, um, you go into it like an optimistic, like prospector looking for gold, right? And you, you think you're in the creek and you're looking for stuff, but unfortunately you're just standing over like a litter box, right? And just you're sipping through and you think it's a gold nugget, but nope, this is cat poop, right? You do it again. Nope. That's his little piss nugget. Like it's just bad news, right? And so there's gotta be a better way of doing things when it comes to uh, dealing with DLP. Workflow automation helps streamline incident management. These automated workflows, they, they help with faster decision-making with real-time data. It's scalable. So if you have a lot of DLP incidents coming in, it's orchestrated. It handles it in the background and adapts to meet re your requirements. It provides audit trails. It helps mitigate risk through rapid incident detection. It prompts for action. Structured responses, predefined workflows, and ensures a speedy resolution. So what does this actually look like? I have a user going out. They've done something bad. Maybe it's good. Who knows? It is a uh, you know, legal team and they're, they're taking something out. They're going to do that. I will always provide the context. I will show you this information. But how do I orchestrate this in the background? So let's say that something bad happens. The user uploads something to box.net. We take that. The workflow automation kicks in and notifies the user. It says, hey, 
comes in via Slack. Why did you do this? They provide a business justification. That justification will go to their manager or the HR. So maybe it is one of those coaching opportunities. Hey, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing these things. Or maybe it's a valid business use case. We don't know. But at the end of the day, it takes this, that entire incident's closed out. The DLP administrator doesn't have to worry about doing anything. It's been highly orchestrated on the back end. It improves the incident resolution and it leads to a better overall user experience, minimizes the holds up. Think about it. A typical incident could take two to four hours to resolve. This will be done in a matter of minutes. So to recap, looking at the data protection platform, focusing in around the efficacy of your data, an engine that can be used to create different rules for depending on the outcome of the intended purpose, right? Maybe it's a portal user. I can focus in on this stuff, work from anywhere, email type of things, whether it's a quarantine or a watermarking of the file. Going back over here, endpoint DLP, be able to scan those local files and look for violation content to allow that user to copy uh, something to a USB drive, but still encrypting it. And then looking at data security posture management, going out to your private cloud, scanning instead of looking for misconfigurations in your environment, like uh, a root user right here and a, vulner, uh, a protocol like SSL or S I'm sorry, SSH open to the public. And then trying to figure out, well, is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know. But I do know that it's bad if there's PCI data and it's a root user and it's open to the world, providing context. And last but not least, workflow automation. Unload the burden from the users, the DLP administrators, I'm sorry, from having to carry the weight to work through all those incidents to really focus on their job as opposed to working through some of those business as usual um, use cases still have an audit trail, reduce your head count, be able to do more with less. And with that said, that's my time. Until next time, I appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you.